Philippians chapter number 3, we'll begin reading verse number 8. The Apostle Paul writes, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Now in verse number 8, doubtless, we know, without doubt. Right? In other words, he's got full assurance, full confidence in the fact that everything that once had value to him, he counts all things but loss. It says, it doesn't matter what I do before I met Christ. It doesn't matter how much in, you know, intellect I had, how much training he had. Keep in mind, the Apostle Paul studied his entire life to be a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as he writes. Okay, a Pharisee. Right? He did everything by the book. And the Pharisees were the legalistic sect that said, as long, you know, you got to keep all these rules. And there's a lot of them. Okay? And I mean, the Apostle Paul said, after the flesh, no man could find fault in him. Now, you'd look at that guy and say, that guy knows what he's doing. But more importantly, I believe that guy is doing the right thing. In the mind of the Jews, he was supposed to be an example. Right? They were going to put him on a pedestal. He studied under the best leaders. Right? The best teachers. They had the first five books of the Old Testament committed to memory. I mean, this guy was committed. But he says, doubtless, all my knowledge, all the works all the teaching that I had, all the philosophers, all the social connections that he had. Because keep in mind, when he came out and said, I'm for Jesus, he was an outcast to everybody in Jerusalem. Right? I'd say even more so than the rest of the apostles. Because he used to be one of them. And then, you know, our pastors taught on it. In order to be a Pharisee, you had to be married. Well, then later on, the apostle Paul writes that, he would that all men were like him which was what? unmarried well if he was and then he wasn't what happened? his wife left him because of his stand for Christ but so this guy lost everything but he says I count it all but loss because I've gained so much but what did he gain? well first he says the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He said, in comparison to Christ, the world has nothing for me. He says, in comparison to Christ, what I knew, I didn't know anything. I mean, we talked on it not too long ago, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. He says, what I thought I knew didn't turn out to mean anything. Then verse number 9, goes on to say and be found in him he says first it's one thing to know about Christ it's another thing to be in him he says you can know about Christ you can be taught about Christ I mean Nicodemus came to him by night and said we know that you're of God because no man can do what you do except God be with him just because you know about him doesn't mean that you're found in him but he says to be found in him and then goes on to say, having not my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He says, everything that I knew couldn't make me righteous. He said, even after I heard about Jesus, still couldn't make myself righteous. I had to be conformed and subservient enough to allow him to place me in himself. He's the true vine. Thankfully, he grafted in one for the Gentiles, and we can be in him as well. He says, be, by being found in him, that's where the righteousness comes from God, by faith. Couldn't earn it. Couldn't give it to yourself. Even if God put a box out here down in the floor tonight and said, you know, this morning, hey, here's all the righteousness that you could ever need, but we wouldn't be able to touch it and put it on ourselves. It had to be imputed unto us. That meant God gave it to us on purpose and wanted it to stick. Because righteousness can't stick to me. I'm sin-cursed. 
So he robed me in the righteousness of his son until like Wednesday night we heard one of these days I get a new body like his. Until then, I mean, the Bible says that daily he renews his promises towards us. Every day, no matter, you know, where I've been, how many times I've failed him, how many times I put my foot in my mouth because, you know, I say a whole lot more than I think, right? A little bit of a, a filter missing still. No matter what, I do, every morning he wakes up and says, he's still my child. And gives me his righteousness. Not because I've earned it, but because you know, I may not be the smartest in the world. I was smart enough to know I needed Jesus. And because I accepted the one that he said had a name above every other name. The one that in his eyes was altogether lovely. The only begotten of the Father. Because I love the one that the Father loves, he gives me righteousness. Then, verse number 10, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. So, three-step plan here. Pretty simple. He says, first, I knew, he literally knew, the Apostle Paul saw him on the road to Damascus. There's bright light. I mean, he got such a good look, he went blind for a little bit. And he said, first, he knew about him, but then one day he met him. Then second, he said, now that I know him, I don't want anything except him. I want to forget all that I used to know so that I can learn more about him. And then, he says, for the purpose of, I want to get more like him so that one, I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. And then, the last one, being made conformable unto his death. And we're going to hit on them things here in a second. But as I read that verse, the Lord just said, hey, there's some things worth knowing. He said, everything that I've gone through, through salvation, all that God has taught me, all the preparation that God has given me is for the express purpose that I may know or that I may have access to deeper things in God. Right? When you first got saved, you just happy. Right? The world was your oyster. Grass was greener, sky was bluer. Even rainy days looked good, right? But the Apostle Paul says, I was the same way, but then I also learned there's a deeper level. There's something that's richer than just knowing that your sins have been taken away. Jesus did, didn't save you to forgive your sins. He saved you so that, one, is predestinated that you'd be conformed to the image of His Son. That you would become like Him. And then because we have a relationship then the fellowship right well start in verse number 10 that I may know him it's worth knowing Jesus but see he's not talking about salvation that was back in verse number 8 he says that I may know him the person of Christ to have that relationship how much you know about Jesus not how much does somebody in your life know about Jesus. Not how much have you heard the preacher talk about Jesus. How much do you know in your life, personally, about what Christ has done for you, can do for you, will do for you? Do you know about His character? you know about His traits? How good of a friend are you to Jesus? Because He's the friend that's taking closer than a brother to us. But He says, everything that God did was so that I could know Him. How well you know the Father? How well acquainted are you with the Spirit? They said Christ went to the cross not just to redeem a fallen man, but to restore a relationship. So how much do we take advantage of that? I mean, I told the teens on Sunday night, we were talking about different ways to study the Bible. I said, we go topical index. I said, there's big topics. You can't just start with Jesus and expect to finish that study in, you know, a week. Right? You can break Jesus down into the works that Jesus did. You can, you know, just break it down into his birth. You can break it into, you know, the crucifixion and all that happened there. 
There's a whole lot that you can do studying Jesus. Well, how much do you know about him? Because it's one thing to know that a woman touched the hem of his garment and her issue of blood was taken away. But how many times have you, just by faith, because that's what verse 8 and 9 is all talking about, everything that we have is the virtue of faith. Because God gave us a measure of faith and we are rewarded when we say, despite all the things that I can see, all the things that make sense to my flesh, all the things that carnally say, don't put your faith in God, when we do it anyway, He rewards it. Not because we deserve it, but because we had enough common sense to know that He said, believe, and we say, I'm just going to believe. So how many times have you in a midnight hour just prayed Lord I don't deserve anything I don't even deserve your time like that woman with the issue of blood but Lord I need to I don't even know what I need she spent everything she had going to every doctor that she could find gave it all away just trying to find out what she needed and those nights Lord I don't know what I need but I know you've got it and you may feel like you didn't get much done but then you just all of a sudden there's a peace that passes all understanding it's almost like you can feel the hand of the Holy Ghost on your back saying hey it's all going to be alright but how much do you know about him I don't have to go very far right all I got to do is go to my knees the Bible says that in the eyes of God it's as if I'm standing in the very throne room of God I don't need a priest to pray to how much do we take advantage of? How well do you know Him? How much do you know about His love for others? Because we taught on about three weeks ago that He commanded us to love others with the love that He showed us. And He said that the love that He showed us was the love that the Father showed to Him. So we're supposed to love others as God. But how much do you know about the love of God? Because, yes, there's the God Christ, but He was also the God-man Christ. His example was for us to know what to do, how to do, how to go. But then, it says not just know Him. It says, and the power of His resurrection. See, I've still got that old man, the sinful man, the one that thinks things that I often don't do, but I really want to do. Like when I'm getting chewed out on the phone by somebody at work for something that they did wrong. Right? I'm just like, I just I want to shoot their pinky toe off. Don't want to kill them. Just, they really, don't want to take their big toe because then they'd walk funny for the rest of their life. I just, just a little one. Lord, I don't think it's that much. Right? The old man, it's rational. But the old man, he's still alive right now. One day he knows he's going to the grave. Right, but he says to know the power of his resurrection. He got up out of the grave so that the old man could stay crucified to the cross with Christ. That the old part of me would die out and I'd become a king to rule and reign over this body. The power of the resurrection of Christ is not that I can live like God wants me to live, but that he can live in me and be pleasing unto God. The power of the resurrection is that I yield and Christ does. It is a great blessing, it's a great gift that Christ said, not only will I do what it takes to save you, I will live in you through the Holy Ghost and do what you cannot do. I can read this all day, all day long. But part of the power of the resurrection is that the Word is spiritually discerned and the Spirit lives in me. There's a lot of people that don't know God that will say a whole lot about the Bible that they've committed decades to studying and they're all wrong. Why? Because they don't know the one of the power of His resurrection. He lives forevermore and He lives in me. The power of His resurrection is the fact that you once that you used to have, you don't want no more. Why is that? Because we're planted on a solid rock by the rivers of water. I shall not be moved. Well, what keeps me there? The power of His resurrection. I can get up and walk away if I want to, but if I desire the power of the new man, He'll make me into something that, like Job said, though He try me, it should come forth as gold. Though He slay me, I'll still serve Him. 
Because I desire to be the new man more than I desire to be the old man. I mean, Dad used to sing that song every now and then. The tape's probably been ate up so much. Brother Randy, it's been played over the years. Right? The old man is dead. That's a great thing. But how often do we let him up off of the... That's why Christ said, take your cross daily and follow him. He had to go to the cross once because he did it right. I'm imperfect. I got to take the cross with me because I got to nail my flesh to it every day. Every now and then, the thought will come on my head, oh, sucker's trying to get off of there. We got to go put a few more nails in them. But I have to take my cross with me because daily I have to choose that I want to be the new man. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know what it is to know the will of God, to do the will of God, and to be in the perfect will that God would have me to be in. Because didn't we teach last week that his meat was to do the Father's business? Doesn't matter what the flesh wants, I desire to do what God wants me to do. That is a trait of the new man. You, still, you didn't care what God wanted you to do. For a moment, you still may not care what God wants you to do. But eventually, either the Holy Ghost will get a hold of you, or one day you're going to stand before God, and then you'll care. And the reason you'll care is, He gave it all so that I could have life, and life more abundantly. So why do we not embrace it all the time? Why do we want to go back to the old man? The Apostle Paul said, it doesn't matter what the world has, I count it as dung. I want to be the new creature that Christ envisioned me to be. Yeah, I'm still on a potter's wheel. I'm not finished yet, but one day I will be. But I want to get as close as I can here so that I can be the best example for others of what a Christian ought to be. So how well do you know the power of His resurrection? How often are you more like what you used to be instead of what God wants you to be? How often do we make the conscious choices that not today... I want to be more like him by the end of the day than I was at the beginning of the day. Instead of just getting in here and reading something that we know, Lord, show me something different. Knock edges off of me. Fill in some of them cracks in my life. Make me more into a vessel of honor. Because I want to be used for your honor and your glory. And then third one. Being made... Or, sorry and knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. Right, we thought, I can't remember how many weeks it is, they're all running together now. I'm getting old, Brother Brian. I'm getting gray hair. Not as much as Jeffrey, but I'm getting gray hair. <laughs> no, I mean, we taught on the definition of love is sacrifice. Then we, week after that, we taught on compassion is when you're Affection for somebody else, you choose to take their suffering for them. Everything that Christ suffered in this life was for our gain. So when he says the fellowship of his suffering, he's saying, Lord, in order to be like you, I understand there's going to be suffering. The world hates us because they don't know us. All they know is that we we've got something that they don't have and they don't like us for that your very existence is a reminder of the fact that they're missing something right? sadly to say some other Christians aren't going to like you because they're not very Christian right? there was a religious crowd that hated Jesus too we're in good company right? there are those that wish to do you ill, but really it's not them. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness and high places, rulers of darkness. Right? It is the master of this world that has so blinded them that they are our enemy. But we taught on compassion. Even your most hated enemy, if you see that they're in suffering and pain, and it's great enough, you'll have compassion for them. All the hate will be replaced with affection. It's the beauty of the Good Samaritan. He found a Jewish boy by the side of the road. That Jewish boy wouldn't have, you know, spit on him if he was on fire. Jews hated the Samaritans. If the roles would have been reversed, the Jew would have just gone right on by. But the Samaritan, even though he knew that man hates me, 
but I see the state he's in and I have compassion on him to know to be acquainted with the sufferings of Christ is to know what it is to be rejected to be alone thankfully we don't ever have to be as alone as he was because he said he'd never leave us nor forsake us but he knew what it was to truly be alone suspended between heaven and earth as the father broke fellowship with him and he bore the weight of the world's sin upon his shoulders he truly was alone he suffered with people that wanted what he had but wasn't willing to go the way that Jesus instructed the rich young ruler he wanted to have eternal life but he wasn't willing to give up like the apostle Paul said doesn't matter what I have I need him he wasn't that far personally I believe Nicodemus got saved I think there was fruit after he talked to Jesus in John chapter number 3 one he showed up with Joseph of Arimathea and he spent a lot of money on grave clothes and spices and ointments to prepare the body of Jesus for entombment he also defended Christ as much as he could on the Sanhedrin council he stood up and spoke he said hey if he's a God there's nothing we can do to stop him so why don't we just hang back and wait and see what happens right? you know what Nicodemus was risking when he did that same thing that the apostle Paul risked being an outcast being thrown out but why did he do that because the love of God just wants to do what God wants to do Amen. that desire in your heart now suffering doesn't come from God suffering comes from the world from our own flesh I'm my own worst enemy but to know the sufferings of Christ is to know what it is to be in the will of God there's effort in doing what God wants you to do there's struggle some days you got to kick yourself to get yourself out of bed so that you can get up and press toward the high calling of the mark of Christ Jesus it's hard but when we know his sufferings we also know the joy of what it is to be in the Father's will you know why Christ endured what he endured for us because the Father willed it you know what the reward was on the other side of that he's got a throne not just any throne all judgment's been given unto him right? he has all power he rose victorious with the keys of death hell and the grave I'm not going to get all that but I will be a joint heir to his throne right? I understand that good things are worth sacrificing for and when like we heard about on Wednesday night when I stand before God and my deeds after I got saved are placed wherever they're placed and they pass through the fire of God's judgment I want what's left to be gold, silver and precious gems I don't want them to be burnt up as wood, hay and stubble I want to hear well done thou good and faithful servant I want to hear that you weren't always perfect but you're more like Christ than you used to be you know you've got to be made willing to suffer as he suffered I don't know what it will be in your life but when you know his suffering you also know the grace of God the love of God the mercy of God the providence of God you'll understand a little bit more about how God's got a plan even though when we don't understand it right through suffering we prove our worth you know how I find out if something's gold because fool's gold looks like gold but it's not gold you bite fool's gold you're going to chip a tooth you bite gold you're going to leave a dent in it that's why they use it in all the western movies the bartender would bite the gold coin and see if it was real or not right, well how does the world no, I mean the bible says that God put in earthen vessels a treasure I mean I just look like dirt but how do you know if what he's got is real if it's got value you got to test it you got to poke it 
Every now and then somebody might try and take a bite out of me only to realize, oh, that's gold. I mean, it's a, too many examples to go through them all. But diamonds, you know how you tell something to glass or a diamond? You take it and you get something heavy and you whack it. It's not real pleasant if you're the diamond, but the glass shatters and the diamond doesn't. In fact, I've seen it. You can put a diamond on an anvil, hit it with the biggest sledgehammer that you can find, and the diamond will actually dig into the anvil. The hammer and the anvil didn't make a mark on the diamond, but the diamond left an impression on the other two. When you're under the worst pressure, when you're going through great suffering, that's when the world says, what he's made of is different than what I'm made of. To be made companion to his suffering. Lord, let me be an example like you were. You're going to suffer, but the result of that suffering is that others know God put a treasure in him. There's something to what that guy said. And the more they get stripped away of Jordan, the more Christ can shine through. Eventually, I mean, Bob says fruit of the Spirit. You plant something in a pot, eventually it's going to outgrow that pot. God may have to replant me into a bigger vessel. Well, if it gets too big, you can't just pull it out because the way things are shaped. You may have to crack the vessel. Lord, if that's what you desire, break me so that I can continue to grow. That's a hard thing to pray, a harder thing to live through. But the Apostle Paul said it was worth it. Then the last one in this verse, he says, being made conformable unto his death. You know what that means? Conformable means in like manner. To replicate. To mimic. Right? To make a mold of. Saying all of this serves one purpose. To prove that literally he's not Saul no more, he's Paul. He's the new man. But see, what good does it do us? Come in, listen to preaching every week, let it roll off us like water on a duck's back, get used to it, right? Because people don't believe this. Until I was about, I don't know, 21. I didn't realize my dad hacked when he preached because I'd heard it my whole life. Right? Didn't understand it. People are like, why does he do that? I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Now I get it, but still, I've tuned it out. Why? Because that's just what I'm used to. I think it's weird when people don't do that. And the first time visitors, they come in, their eyes get about this big. Right? Why? Because most people aren't used to that. Right? We can get used to to hearing the same voice. We can get used to the hard preaching, good preaching, but you can become callous to it. But what good is it to get in here and read and find out what God wants you to do only to half do it? He says to be made conformable. In other words, Lord, take all you want because I don't want it. I want instead what you'll give me on the other side. Christ was made sin. He became sin that knew no sin. He left all of his righteousness. He left all of his holiness. He left all the praise of angels. And he said, I'm walking into a grave. And when he came out, he was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Had the keys. He had the blood that he went and took to heaven, put on the mercy seat of God. He understood that the suffering served a purpose. And the Apostle Paul says to be made conformable. In other words, replicate in my life what Christ did for me. That's what baptism is supposed to symbolize. That we died out to sin and we were raised in newness of life with Him. But to be made conformable to His death is to say, Okay, Lord, I believe that you want to make me into something different. So have your way. But it's easy along the way to even get callous to that. You can tune out the voice of the Holy Ghost. And if you don't believe me, hallelujah, you haven't been where I've been. You can get to the point where you don't hear it. 
or where you ignore it. You can get to the point where it doesn't matter how hard the preacher's preaching, it just doesn't affect you because you're so cold. You can get to the point where instead of the new man, you're trying to dig up the old man as fast as you can. But conformable unto his death. Christ never looked back at the cross. He hated it. Despised the suffering and the shame, but he endured it for the joy that was set before him. Not proud of who I used to be. Don't want to look back at it. I wish he'd stayed dead. But every now and then I need to be reminded that I'm only human. And that I'm not quite what God wants me to be. I need those reminders so that I can, okay, Lord, let's bury that part today. Let's get rid of that. But this verse isn't the only thing. Things that we may know. Colossians 4, verse number 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. I need to work on that. Not always graceful when I speak. But why should our speech always be graceful, seasoned with salt? That ye may know how you ought to answer every man. Are you able to, regardless of who comes in the building today, are you able to, not maybe the most eloquently, maybe not the most drawn out and, you know, structured way to do it, but if somebody were to ask you why you do what you do, would you be able to give an answer to every man? Do you know why you do what you do? Has God settled in your soul certain landmarks throughout your life, certain verses through the Word of God that He's engraved into the fleshy tables of your heart that if somebody were to say, I've never seen anybody do that, you can give the answer as to, well, this is, I just do it because that's what God wants me to do. Right? And He told Timothy to abstain from the appearance of all evil. I'd rather be safe than sorry. Or what? Why do you go to church so much? Why do you have 9,000 revival meetings over the summer when everybody else was hiding because of COVID? Why would that happen? Because I like being around God more than I like being around people. I mean, that's a beauty. He's in here, but he promised if two or three together, and he'd be in the midst. He's everywhere that I go, but every now and then, he just shows out. And I like being when that happens. How many people, if they were asked, well, because the pastor said we, we were having a meeting and we were going to show up. Why do you do that? Well, that's the way the grandma did it. Do you know why you do what you do? It's one of the great things about this Baptist distinctives. The pastor preached on Y'all know why you're Baptist. But you also ought to know why you live your life the way that you do. Is it habit or is it in a... You know, the decision that, no, I'm going to do it this way because I believe that's what God wants me to do. Does life influence you more than the thought, I want to be in the perfect presence of God? That's why our answers ought to be with grace and seasoned with salt. Because if you give them an honest answer, it may rub them the wrong way. Well, I don't do that because I don't want to be a sinner. He saved me and called me a saint. He doesn't refer to me as a sinner anymore, so I don't want to be one. But by implication, that means that if they do it, they're a sinner. There's a way to tell somebody that they're not right with God to where instead of being offended, they thank you. And if you've ever been to church service where God chews you up down one side and then down the other and then you hit the altar before the invitation's even been given, you get up sobbing, you know what it is to be told that you're not right but be thankful that somebody told you. It may be hard, but if it's given with grace, with love, seasoned with salt, you know that salt used to, I'm glad we don't live in this age anymore, but used to, they'd put salt in wounds to keep them from getting infected. It was a part of medicine. Can't imagine that that was very enjoyable. I know what rubbing alcohol feels like. Can't imagine having salt rubbed into your, you know, a cut. And I'm not curious enough to do it and then try it to figure out what it feels like. But next time, if I get a cut on my hand, neosporin's fine. I don't need salt. Band aids are okay. But season with salt, it preserves it, 
keeps that thing that will rot and corrupt and eat away at it from getting hold in there. And grace, that's just the type of the balm of Gilead where it may hurt to hear, but God can soothe that pain. Our answer shouldn't just be, well, I do it because I'm right and you're wrong. Yeah, that's real helpful. Thank you for such insight into why you do what you do or why you believe what you believe or why I need to be born again. Best thing you can always do is tell people, I, I do what I do because here's what Jesus did for me. I don't do it by my own strength. I do it by the grace of God. He helps me to do it. It's not about me. It's about what He does in me. But could you give an answer? Here's, here's the bar. Could you answer the question as Jesus would have answered it? Because that's our standard. To be Christ-like. We are His ambassadors on earth. We have Him living in us through the person of the Holy Spirit so that we can overcome the world. So if someone were to ask us, it's God's will that we would give the answer that God wants them to hear. Are we able to do it? Because that's something worth knowing. Then finally, 1 John 5.13, these things have I written that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Do you really know where your hope is today? My hope's anchored in the veil. My hope is not in a man, it's in the name of Christ Jesus. Emmanuel, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, wonderful, counselor. But do you know when everything else fades away, you really know all that God is capable of doing? Some people got very little God. They claim to serve the same God as me, but they got a very little God because everything upsets them. I know where my hope is. I know the name that is above every other name. I know the name that was so powerful it had to be spoken by an angel to the guy who was going to name him because it's such a great name, man couldn't come up with it on his own. God had to tell man what to name God's son. The name that so many people got angry at because he was just giving away forgiveness and they thought you had to earn it. The one that spoke like no man spoke. The one that made himself of no reputation but was altogether lovely. The one that's been there in my darkest nights and on my highest mountains. The one that tells me how much he loves me even though I know how much I don't deserve to love. John said, these things have I written to you that are saved so that you can know that you're saved but so that you can also know the name of Christ. You ever meet somebody? I'm terrible with names. You ever meet somebody and somebody say, hey, this is so-and-so. I don't, I don't remember the face. I don't remember the name. Very seldom is it the other way around. Yeah, I remember that name, but I don't know what they look like. So many Christians, they forget because they don't fellowship with them, because they don't hang around them, because they allow the world to flood their vision. They become so overwhelmed that all they can see is their problem and not anything past it. You can ask them, yeah, they know they're going to heaven. Well, okay, how's Jesus, Jesus able to answer this problem in your life? And they look at you like deers in the headlight. Well, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, he said cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. He said that the arm of flesh will fail you, but I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. He said that the world would try to shake our foundations, but we've got a solid rock, the rock of ages. He said that there's a cleft in that rock that I can't see him, but every now and then he just shows out a little bit and I get to see his glory. I know the name that I put my faith in. I know the person of Christ Jesus. How do you know? Because he's my friend. But see, my hope is not in what he's done. That, for salvation, it's already finished. 
But when he says that you may know the name, it's so that when you wake up today, yeah, he was Jesus enough to save me. So if he was Jesus enough to save me, isn't he Jesus enough today to get me through today? It's one thing to know you're saved. It's another thing to live like he can handle everything in today. There's a lot of people. They're saved on their way to heaven. But they live defeated, dejected, depressed. Because they just don't know what's going to happen. I don't need to know. Jesus has it. That's good enough for me. Because I know what Jesus means. It means that he was before anybody else. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And without him was nothing made. So when God said, let there be light, Jesus was the one that said it, because he's the Word. I think he can handle my problems. He's the one that met Moses in a bush one day. And the bush was on fire. And he told him how he's going to use them to lead God's people out of Israel. And Moses is sitting there, just like us, saying, Lord, I don't talk, talk very well. Uh, they're not going to believe me. I'm a murderer. And, um, oh yeah, I've been uh, watching sheep for the past four decades. And uh, not very accustomed to society anymore. God winked at his ignorance and said, just go do what I tell you to do. He's the one that wrote those commandments with the finger of God onto those two tablets. He's the one that touched the hollow of Jacob's hip. He's the one that met Joshua. And Joshua said, are you for us or for them? He said, neither. I'm for God. But, if you're on God's side, I'll fight for you. Walls will come down. Commands every angel in heaven. Every demon in hell. The study of the madman of Gadara. When Jesus says, get out, they got to go. He has all power. And he loves me completely. I like knowing who he is. That name that is above every other name, it means something because one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. It's one thing to know the person. It's another thing to know the name. The world doesn't like the name Jesus. They're okay with God. They're okay with Christ. They're okay with Mary. They don't like Jesus. You know why? Because that name means something. Does it mean something to you? Because it's worth knowing. That's the name that martyrs throughout history would go out singing how much they loved. Because they knew what the name meant and they weren't going back up on it. They'd be thrown to lions and tigers in the Colosseum in Rome. They'd be burned at the stake. They'd be stretched on the rack, drawn and quartered. And all the while, they did it because they loved that name that they heard about. The name that meant so much to them that it changed their life. So how much you know today? Don't need to know it all, but some things are worth knowing. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.